Welcome to CPA Australia's live webinar. This is Code of Ethics and APESB. And presenting today, we are joined by Chana Bigcha Singh and Josephine Hayes. Now to start us off, I would like to welcome to today's moderator into the conversation. Michelle Webb is CPA Australia's Knowledge Management Executive. And Michelle, I'm just opening up your mic there. Good afternoon. Hi, Linda. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us at today's webinar. So Chana is the Chief Executive Officer at the Accounting Professional and Ethical Standards Board, overseeing the issue of the APES Board pronouncements for the accounting profession in Australia. Josephine is responsible for ethics and professional standards policy advocacy and reform for CPA Australia. I will now hand over to Chana to get us started. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for attending this code um, code webinar, which is very important given that it's about eight months for the code to start in Australia, 1st January 2020. The code has been restructured and without doubt, it is the most significant rewrite of the code in the last 20 years. There are many important changes to the restructured code and in fact too many to cover in the limited time we have today. So this presentation has been prepared in a manner that it provides you with the key highlights of the changes and also as a useful takeaway which you can refer to later on as you uh, prepare for the adoption of the code. So I'll be uh, stepping through some slides quite quickly, but you can go back and have a look at it later on. If you are an auditor, you should be aware that the auditing standard ASR 102 uh, relevant ethical requirements provides legal backing for the code. And also if you're an SMSF auditor, it's referred to in the SMSF regulations. So let me... Uh, sorry, just uh, trying to go to the first slide. Yep, so that's the agenda. So every decade we have a financial crisis and they, then there's intervention from the legislators, regulators, and other stakeholders. The origins for the major changes in the code of the restructure, audit partner rotation, and the non-compliance with laws and regulations, all of these can be traced back to stakeholder concerns raised post the GFC. So I want to reflect a bit on the importance of professional ethics for the accounting profession. There's a live issue right now in the UK that highlights the critical importance of audit quality and auditor independence. It relates to Carillion PLC, a British company that in 2017 went into compulsory liquidation with uh, liabilities of seven billion pounds. KPMG had been the auditor for 19 years, but never issued a qualified or modified audit opinion. In fact, all the big four firms were criticized because Deloitte was the internal auditor, EY provided turnaround advice, and PwC provided consulting work. The collapse of Carillion has led to a number of UK inquiries into the audit profession in particular, but it does bring in accountants in general as well. Um, and there's the Kingman Review, which is looking at creating a new regulator and uh, disbanding the existing regulator, the UK FRC. In addition, there has been a call for ban on all but essential audit-related services for audit clients. Whether the prohibition on non-assurance services will be implemented is unknown at this stage, but it is clear that ethical lapses leads to more rules and prohibitions due to the loss of public confidence and trust. In April 2019, another UK review from the Business, Energy, Industrial and Strategy Committee has issued a report to reform the UK audit market. This report states that the action taken post-GFC to address audit failures have been ineffective in increasing competition in the audit market and delivering acceptable audit quality. Some of the key recommendations are the detection and investigation of potential fraud must be a priority in any audit, 
and they are also recommending an economic split between audit and non-audit sections of the firm. They have also put forward the concept of joint audits for FTSE 350 uh, entities, which involves a big four firm and a challenger firm. And it's not only in the UK locally, uh, as we are aware, there has been the Banking Royal Commission. It has uncovered misconduct in the financial services industry, which is truly shocking in terms of how widespread the misconduct was, the knowledge of its existence by management and boards, and the quantum of the failures in terms of the estimated three billion in respect of fee for no service and the number of customers involved. The government and the opposition have agreed that action is needed, but until the election is concluded, uh, the way forward may not be clear. As you can see from this slide, the remediation costs across the entities is estimated to be over $7 billion. And at some point, people will start looking at other parties connected to these entities, such as the auditor. So why do we need professional ethics? We need it as it protects the public interest and confidence in capital markets. It maintains and increases trust in the accounting profession, and if adhered to establishes a robust standards of professional conduct. So now let's look at APES 110, which is based on the international code issued by the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants. The ISBA code has been adopted or used as the basis for national standards in over 120 jurisdictions, including Australia, and is also used by the largest 27 international networks of firms, which is known as the Forum of Firms. And as you can see, it has been translated into about 40 languages. So the current status of the code uh, in the G20 countries is on that slide. Uh, about 12 countries it has been adopted or based on. Four other countries on a convergence path, and uh, India has committed to adopt. So there's a uh, good coverage of the G20 countries uh, who have adopted the international code. So what are some of the highlights of the restructured code? There's a new user guide and an updated glossary. Uh, the requirements are now separate to guidance material, which means it will be easier to be implemented by accountants, but also for enforcement action by regulators. APSB is supportive of this approach, as that is the same drafting approach adopted in the other APSB standards in Australia. In fact, when the previous rewrite of the code occurred in 2010, APSB lobbied the ISB for it to be drafted uh, in this manner. And in fact, we drafted substantial portions of it to show them how it could be done. There has been also refinements to the conceptual framework, which we will get to shortly. And the auditor independence provisions have been recharacterized as independent standards. The restructured code also includes the NOCLA provisions and audit partner rotation provisions in the new drafting format. There are also strengthened provisions on non-assurance services, which we will get to towards the latter part of the presentations, and, and the new inducements as well. In the Australian version, which is APES 110, we have built in additional features such as bookmarks and pop-up definitions, and this will make it very easy for you to navigate the code because the actual document is over 210 pages. So the incorporations of these PDF features will be quite useful, um, but you need to download the document from the APSP website, and it will only work once you have downloaded it and you have it on your PC. There's also a mapping table that is available from our home page, and that will show you what the new provision is versus the extant provision. So, so if you need to update your policies and procedures in your firm, then that will be a useful document to use um, to update your policies and procedures. 
So one of the key changes is the new structure. So previously, what you see as part two about members in business actually came at the end of the code uh, as the existing part C. So that meant for a lot of members in business, which is about 70% of the accounting profession, you had to look at part one and then look at uh, part two, which was right at the end. So in between you had part three dealing with members in public practice and the independence provisions. So that was not um, uh, easily, na uh, you couldn't easily navigate it. So the international board has determined to put part two right after part one. So if you're a member in business, you need to only look at part one and part two. For uh, people in public practice, you now actually need to look at the whole code because part two could still be applicable to you in the context of your employment relationship with the firm. So the code is the whole code is applicable to members in public practice. So let's look at the conceptual framework. The conceptual framework at its core has not really changed. There are five fundamental principles and then there are, if I go to the next slide, five threats to those fundamental principles. It's, it's the, the changes are, when you get to the conceptual framework, it's how it's going to apply in practice. Currently, we apply a safe, uh, threats and safeguards approach where we think about threats and we think that if we can come up with a safeguard to address that threat, that we can continue to do that professional activity. This is no longer the case in the, with the new code. Identified threats that are not at an acceptable level must be addressed in one of three ways. So either you have to eliminate the circumstances creating the threat, or you, you can apply a safeguard if one is available, but if not, you have to decline or end the specific professional activity or service. So if you look at the, uh, the globe we have there, so you can see the three stages. You identify the threats, evaluate and address, but also the outer, in the outer rim, there is, you need to, um, you need to exercise your professional judgment remain alert for new information or changes, and also use the reasonable third-party test. These enhancements to the conceptual framework clearly require change of mindset because it's no longer a threats and safeguards approach. The, the code is also now more clear that the conceptual framework explicitly addresses independence. And independence, as you know, is linked to the principles of integrity and objectivity. The categories of threats to independence are, are the same, so there's no change there. Um, and you have to go through the same process of the conceptual framework when you're dealing with independence matters. So let's do a quick poll to see if you recall when the new code is effective. So Linda, if you could please open the polling question. Um, so the poll is, what is the effective date of the restructured code of ethics? You've got four choices. If you could click your response and then remember to click the submit button. You have about 30 seconds left.
Okay, so let's look at the results. So we have 29% saying it's 1st January 2019, 15 1st July 2019, and 32 1st January 2020, and 3% 1st July 2020. So the correct answer is C, 1st January 2020. The 1st July date could also be applicable because the international code is starting from 1st July 2019. So most of the international firms will be starting from that date. Okay, so uh, moving on, the next one we will look at is audit partner rotation or long association uh, as it's known. With this, this is uh, important for people who are auditors as well as people, members in business, because this would impact on how long your auditor could stay on the engagement. So this slide highlights um, some of the changes. So it's quite clear general provisions on long association apply to all audit engagements, uh, whether you are a listed entity, public interest, or unlisted. Uh, public interest or even a proprietary company. Um, so uh, if the entity uh, you are involved with is not a PI, then it's a matter for you to consider the application of the general provisions. And if there are threats to independence, uh, then you need to take some action. Post-GFC, there was pressure from the international regulators to deal with the familiarity threat by increasing the engagement partner cooling off period from two years to five years in a similar manner to the UK and the US. Uh, and based on what has happened there, I'm not sure that it has particularly worked well for them either. At the international level, APSB with, our, with the support of our New Zealand colleagues argued that there was no empirical evidence to justify increasing the cooling off period to five years and that that will necessarily lead to enhancement of audit quality. As a concession to Australia, New Zealand, and similar jurisdictions where auditor supply is limited, ISBA has developed the jurisdictional provision for engagement partner cooling off in order to assist with the transition. So what it means is during the next five years from 1st January 2019 to 31st December 2023, uh, for countries like Australia, you will have a three-year cooling uh, partner rotation cooling off period, but after 31st December 2023, you need to move to a five-year cooling off period. Uh, that th this transitional relief will only be available for these five years, although ISBA has committed to review this in 2021. So, uh, I think we at this stage we need to assume that we'll have this transitional relief, and then after that we need to rotate to five-year cooling off. Um, and if there's a change, uh, then it, it could be a bonus. Uh, but I think the decision has been made to head in that direction. So uh, on this slide, you can see even the EQCR has to uh, increase from two years to three years, and uh, there is prohibitions on acting as client relationship partner during the cooling off period that is not allowed. The partner rotation provisions have not really changed with the restructured code. It is still the same one as what APSB issued in April 2018. The impact for the listed and APRA related entities will be that it will be a five years time on and five year cooling off period. APSB also has developed a publication on uh, various scenarios that is uh, addressed in this technical staff Q&A document in that we have also developed flow charts and uh, if you have to make a decision whether you're auditor or you're on the client side, you can work through those flow charts and determine uh, what is applicable for you. In the next 
slide, uh, this is a summary of the requirements for listed and APRA regulated entities. You can see the existing requirements, uh, which are in the current columns, and then the transitional phase from 1st January 2019 to 31st December 2023, and then full provisions after that. And then the next slide shows other public interest entities which exclude listed and APRA regulated entities which are dealt in the previous one. So if I go back, uh, you also have to remember that uh, while the code allows seven years because of the Australian corporations law requirements, it is five years on. Of course, the corporations law does allow a plus two, but that will depend on the board's approval as well as you'll have to apply to ASIC to get that relief. So maybe we look at a few scenarios. Um, and Joe, what do you think of the first scenario? I was just having a look at this first scenario and trying to work out the answer that I would select here, Chana, and working through the facts of the scenario, we have ABC Proprietary Limited is a large proprietary company that is required to undergo an annual audit. John has been the engagement partner for the audit of ABC for five years. John is trying to figure out how the new auditor rotation rules affect his role. So let's take a systematic approach and work through this. After the 30th of June 2019 audit, what are the implications for John? So we know it. 30th of June 2019, he's been on for five years. Uh, so if we go to the slide above, which is, yeah. which is a table above, we see there that uh, he could potentially stay on for another two years um, and then have a cooling off period for five years. So I'd choose option C here. Is that correct? Okay, so let's work through that. Um, the first thing to remember is to figure out uh, what sort of company it is. So this one is actually a large proprietary company. So it won't ah. fall into the uh, public interest entity bucket. So you have to be careful in this one uh, because it's not a public interest entity, whether you are listed or unlisted, then actually he can continue for more than two years as long as he complies with the general provisions. Right, so I was using the wrong table here. Yeah, wrong table, because the tables didn't address property companies. Correct, right. Yeah. So then the correct option yeah. would be D. Is that correct? Yeah, that is correct. Right, so I think that highlights the fact that you've got to be very careful yeah. uh, when you're looking at each particular client to yeah. establish uh, how the entity, how the type of entity has an impact, impact on these rotation on these, rules. On these rotation rules. Yeah. Well, hopefully I might have better luck with the second one. So let's look at the second one, partner rotation scenario two. ABC Limited, Limited. Okay, I need to remember that we've got a we've got a public company here. Is a large public utility that is required to undergo an annual audit. It is not. A listed entity, right, it's not a listed entity, but I would say that it's still a public interest entity here, or APRA regulated entity, no? No, so it's a large public utility, so when you, that would mean that there are a range of stakeholders impacted, and this would then fall into the category of unlisted uh, public interest entity. Right, okay, that helps me with the table that I need to use. Dave has been the engagement partner for the audit of ABC for six years, as at the 30th of June 2019. Dave is trying to figure out how the new auditor rotation rules affect his role. So, what are we asked to do? After the 30th of June 2019 audit, what are the implications for Dave? Well, if he has been on the audit for six years, Using the table at slide 23, I would say that he could stay on for one more year and then based on this table, he would have to cool off for five years because the full provisions would be in effect from 1 January 2019. So I'm going to go for option B here. Yes, that is correct. Um, so 
uh, it is uh, because of it being a large public utility. Uh, it's an unlisted public interest entity, and you are correct, Joe. Uh, they can stay. Uh, they can stay for one more year, and then needs to cool off for five. Excellent. So let's look at the next one. I'm improving. Yes. <laughs> Partner rotation scenario three. Willett Limited is a listed entity. Right. Keep that in mind. Anna is the engagement partner for the audit of Willett Limited. The audit for 31st of December 2019 will be Anna's fourth consecutive year as the engagement partner. So what are we asked to do? When is the last year Anna can perform the audit engagement for Willett Limited before rotating off the engagement? And what would be the required cooling off period? Mm. So let's move to the... So we know it's a listed entity. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the listed entity table. Yeah. So quite simply, listed entity table would mean that it's seven years on and five years calling off. So option D. Okay. So with this one, um, we have to remember that uh, the Australian, so the code says seven years. Yes. But there's a more restrictive requirement in the Corps Act. Ah, yes, you did highlight that yeah. before. Yeah. So therefore, the time on will be five years. Of course, there's the plus two, but that is rarely used in practice. And um, because of the process of getting the board approval and then going to ASIC for approval. Uh, so it's, from what I know, it's rarely used in practice. So you would be normally doing five years on. And then, because we are in the transitional period, they can utilize uh, the three years, um, because Australia is allowed to use the three years cooling off as the jurisdictional provision. Right, so then that would mean the correct answer would be option A. Yes, then that will bring you back to option A. So I think this highlights a few things to us. We need to be very conscious of the type of entity that we're auditing when yeah. we're making these assessments. We need to obviously take into consideration what the code states, but we need to make sure that we're also taking into consideration our local laws and regulations yeah. Yeah. with respect to uh, any particular provisions that relate, including those transitional provisions. Provisions, yes. And, uh, and another quirk of the uh, provisions and uh, we have been in discussions with the international board on this, and we understand that they are going to issue a ISBA technical staff Q&A shortly, is around the end of the jurisdictional provision. So the way it's currently drafted, one may read it, that let's say when we get to 30 June 2023, uh, that, that any time after that you need to be five years, uh, because it ends 31st December 2023. But if you can manage your cooling off in a manner that you start cooling off before you hit 31st December 2023, you can still use that three-year cooling off. Uh -huh. So there's a planning uh, opportunity there if you know for auditors and then for clients as well to manage the cooling off uh, process so that you can potentially use the jurisdictional provision for a bit longer. We understand that ISBA will shortly issue a Q&A on it, and once that's issued, we will also incorporate it to our technical staff Q&A document, because that document, we are hoping to revise it by the end of the year, because the references in that is to the previous code, and we need to update it anyway for the references to the new code. I think that would be very helpful, Chana. Yeah, and then let's move on to non-assurance services. So Section 600 of the code contains specific non-assurance services uh, provisions such as valuation, taxation, and so on. The requirement to apply the conceptual framework has been made more prominent, uh, and the guidance on addressing threats has been enhanced. As, as it is in the current code, there's a overarching prohibition on assuming management responsibilities uh, when providing non-assurance services to audit clients. So 
this slide shows uh, the various management responsibilities, uh, and I'm not going to go through uh, in detail. And it's it's not changed from the existing code. It's just made, made a bit sharper, and uh, that's it. The key, if I just move forward, so the key change in non-assurance services is actually the prohibition on providing recruiting services for a director office or a person who may have significant influence over the accounting records or financial statements. Previously, this only applied to public interest entities, but this has been now expanded to all audit clients. So this is sort of the uh, key change in non-assurance services. There's also a video that you can uh, click on where ISBA board member is talking about this ban and the rationale for it, but I'll let you have a look at it in your own time. The other thing I want to highlight, if I just go back, is that the non-assurance sections have been redrafted, and it has been made uh, to follow a certain structure. And these two slides lays out that structure, which will be useful for you when you come to uh, review those sections um, and understand them. The key thing is earlier you had to actually go looking for the prohibitions, but now uh, when you get to the requirements and the application material, it talks about general provisions, and then it talks about prohibitions. And even the prohibitions are separated between entities that are not PIs and PIs. So it's, it's quite easy to navigate and follow uh, in the restructured code. So let me, and then the prohibitions for PIs, um, these have not changed, but you should be aware that there are prohibitions on an auditor providing certain services for public interest entities. And this slide has those uh, those requirements. And then there are some prohibitions based on materiality. Um, and if it's going to have a material impact on the financial statements, then you shouldn't be providing these services, or if you're a client, not requiring an auditor to provide these services. So the safeguards, uh, these are the safeguards that could be implemented when there are no prohibitions. Um, and these are quite similar to what, uh, uh, what, what was there previously, so there's no real changes uh, in that. So let's look at a new section or revised section on inducement. Uh, so inducements clarifies the appropriate boundaries for offering and accepting of inducements and sets out a framework to follow. So inducements can be illegal. Even if it's not illegal, there could be intent to improperly influence behavior. And if, you, if there's no intent, then you need to apply the conceptual framework. So the key... Uh, the key thing in this is the issue over intent behind the inducements. Is it being offered with the intent to in, improperly influence behavior? I feel the challenge will be how we measure this intent, um, and that's going to be a real challenge when trying to uh, actually apply the standards as well as a regulator to enforce, enforce the standard. I think with this particular issue channel, we had a question around cumulative uh, in little items yeah. may not be may not be significant on their own, yeah. but over time may add up to potentially being something questionable with regards to inducements. Would you have any suggestions in how we could manage that? Yeah, it's going to. Be, uh, that's a good question. I don't know the answer, <laughs> but. Uh, I guess if if somebody's taking you out for uh, lunch every Friday, uh, then you know the perception will be there that they are influencing uh, your decision making. 
So I think this is a one that we'll have to monitor and see how it actually uh, works in practice in the coming years. So one of the things we often refer to here is uh, if you were an outsider looking at this arrangement, would you mm. think that potentially there could be an issue there uh, or it doesn't look uh, doesn't look appropriate given the circumstances and if you were going out every week yeah. it may look a, a lot worse than if it was going out twice a year or, yeah. or once a quarter let's say. It would be more likely to have an inducing effect if it was once a week and they were paying for you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now I'll hand over to Joe and uh, Joe is going to, I oh, know I have one more slide, sorry. Uh, so this slide sets out how you can uh, assess the intent and some relevant considerations. Uh, I think we touched on frequent frequent meals uh, just now. Uh, so I'll leave it to you to read on your own time and now hand over to Joe to talk about NOCLA. Thank you very much, Chana. That was a really informative session with uh, the biggest changes coming through to the code that I think we've seen in more than two decades. Yeah. So it is a really important time for the profession with respect to our ethical and professional standards and where we are going as a mm -hmm. profession. And I think we have a number of external factors that are at play now as well with the introduction of potentially um, ethical requirements over the financial services industry and a new regulator in that space, as well as the outcomes of the Hain Royal Commission. So it is very much an area that's in the spotlight. And I think I'd like to highlight to members as well here that I think the accounting profession was one of the professions that, that was unscathed in, in the Royal Commission because of our vigorous uh, and very well documented and followed professional standards, especially those in respect to financial services. So we are very well placed uh, with where we are with respect to the code uh, and with respect to where we are as a profession within this space. It, it sets us up well for the future, as uncertain as that might be at this point in time. Moving on to NOCLA, we're going to just touch on this because NOCLA has been in operation since 1 January 2018 and so many of you would be familiar with the provisions of NOCLA. But what we wanted to do in this session was touch on some of the questions that we've been getting through from members with respect to how they navigate NOCLA because it can be quite confusing, especially around the concept of substantial harm. What most members I'm finding are doing is when they call me and say they've got an ethical dilemma and it's potentially a no-clar issue, they are jumping to the end result, which may be reporting to an authority. And I have to generally pull them back and say, no, 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 we need to look at the framework that no-clar provides in order to arrive at a decision. So it's not about just automatically reporting to a relevant authority. It's that is really the last step and more often than not an unlikely step, uh, especially too if there are laws and regulations that prohibit that like what is currently in play with tax. But what we wanted to do is remind you of the framework and step you through what you should be doing if any of these particular issues come up. So to remind our members, what we need to do first is look at a non-compliance with law and regulation that potentially causes substantial harm. Now, substantial harm means harm to other stakeholders, not necessarily yourself, not necessarily the client's business, but are there other stakeholders involved where substantial harm may result uh, from a non-compliance with laws and regulations? If that is the case, then there is a framework to go through. And that first part of that framework is about communication and documentation. So it's about communicating with those charged with governance, what you have found, what their response may be. They may not, may not know and they may be prepared to deal with that particular non-compliance and manage it and therefore the rest is a non-issue. Really where there may become an issue is if management do not wish to deal with a non-compliance with laws and regulations. Where does that leave you as their accountant or as their employee working in business? So NOCLA was quite clear in that if there were laws or other considerations that prohibit 
uh, you reporting to an authority, then those should be complied with first and foremost. The uh, NOCLAR provisions do not override your responsibilities when it comes to your legal obligations and therefore you cannot breach confidentiality and put that on NOCLAR provisions. You have to work through that particular framework. So let's have a look at the framework and remind ourselves of what we need to do while uh, we are assessing a NOCLAR issue. I mean that's the important uh, part of NOCLAR, Joe, is, is the response framework because depending on the category you belong to, there are four uh, categories of accountants, you know, the auditor, uh, other member in public practice, a senior finance person like a CFO, and then other members in business. So based on your responsibility, it was attaching a response framework where you work through a process of informing you know, a superior, uh, those charged with governance, which is senior management or a board. So it's working through the process of informing that next level. But as you say, most people jump to the right to the end step of informing uh, an appropriate authority. But hopefully, 90% or more of the things will be easily be dealt with once you start working through that response framework and informing someone else. Then for the ones that are not addressed by that, then you need to think about this concept of substantial harm. Substantial harm, I mean, if I can give some examples, is like the CBA and the money laundering case or even the Banking Royal Commission where, you know, dead customers were charged and there were fees charged but no services were delivered. That is substantial harm. Uh, but and to a wide range, wide of, range stakeholders. of stakeholders. I mean, and general public who yeah. may not be informed. Informed. Mm. Uh, but if you miss a tax filing deadline, that is not really a reportable uh, no class. And it's also about reporting to an appropriate authority who can take action. It's not just putting it in the papers or, you know, giving it to a reporter, NOCLA doesn't allow that. No. It's about reporting to an appropriate authority who can take action, but as you said, if the law precludes you, you have to stop right there. For example, currently for tax, you cannot go and report it because the law precludes it, but it may change with the whistle blowing from 1st July 2019. That's a very, that's a very interesting um, point there. I had a member call me the other day who had a particular issue uh, where there was a suspected fraud discovered and it was tax related and she was looking for advice in regards to how to handle that particular uh, issue with respect to no NOCLAR, with respect to perhaps the whistleblowing provisions that are coming in on 1st of July and also too to ensure that she was doing the right thing by her client and by herself as well. And we worked through, together we worked through a framework of first identifying the fact that the whistleblowing provisions wouldn't apply because the act took place prior to uh, the 1st of July. So that we then worked through the framework of, well, should we be informing the other directors who are not necessarily involved or do not, or were not made aware? This particular member explained to me that the uh, other director was the one who informed her. So there were no other concerns with respect to uh, her obtaining um, information from an employee that she needed to potentially protect. Uh, there were no other consequences there. So therefore, it was about handing it, there was really, the, the decision we, we worked through was that this particular member wasn't required to do anything in this case because it had already been reported to uh, the other directors. They were aware of what was happening. Uh, there was a limited range of stakeholders that would be affected. It wasn't going to cause substantial harm externally or to any other unknowing stakeholders and therefore it was up to the other directors if they decided to take um, further action by reporting it either to the police or to the, to the tax office. There was no obligation at this point for the member to take it any further. Yeah. Whereas the member thought that there was an obligation for her to take that further. So it might be worth us just working through this slide of getting a framework uh, together so you understand what to do when faced with these issues because they can be unexpected, they can 
cause significant worry uh, and our members can, can often not know really what to do because it's not something we tend to come across very often. So I would recommend having a section within your quality control manual which deals with this particular issue. So then if the matter arises, you know that you've got a process to go to to work through. One of the most important things is to understand, obtain an understanding of the matter. Make sure it's full, frank, open, that there's nothing that you're missing or misunderstanding. Then address the matter. Take what you know and what the facts that you have before you to those charged with governance or to your superior if you're a member in business and have that discussion. Then you need to determine whether further action is needed. At this point, it may not be. Those charged with governance or your superior, they may take the action that's required. If they don't, then you do have the option in some cases to determine whether it's appropriate for you to report. If it's an audit related matter, then those options are already there for you under the Corporations Act. They don't exist currently for tax, but anything after 1 July, you would be able to disclose under those whistleblower provisions. That being said, those whistleblower provisions need to be considered very, very carefully because they are not without risk. So then what would you would need to do is to document everything that you've done in relation to this matter because the most important thing to protect yourself with respect to no par issues is to document everything and keep it as a separate file with respect to this client that these are the steps you've gone through to show that you've done an analysis and you've related it back to the provisions within the code. That ensures that you're protected and that you're doing, you're making assessment as best as possible. If, of course, you have any doubts whatsoever during this entire process, then that is what your professional body is here to do, to help guide you through that process and support you through that, if need be. As Chana touched on, there are different frameworks based on whether you're a member in business or whether you are a member in public practice. So there's four variations and the framework specifies different but proportionate approach for each category of the accountants. So it recognises that not all accountants have the same level of influence or the same level of seniority or the same level of access to information. So it does take all of that into consideration with respect to the response that's required. We have two variations for members in public practice. So that's provisions that apply to auditors and provisions that apply for other members in public practice. So they would be like that case that I discussed with you with respect to taxation. Uh, there are different frameworks there with respect to what you need to do. Depending on the client, you would need to familiarise yourself with those particular requirements. Then when we look at the two variations for members in business, this is categorised based on whether you're a senior member in business or whether you're another member in business, which takes into account those particular issues around your influence, uh, your seniority, your access to knowledge and your access to be able to change the outcome. So it's very, very important when you're managing these particular issues to identify what category you fall into based on the client work that you're doing. If you are a member in public practice, it's very possible that you may have a no clar issue that relates to audit or you may have a no clar issue that relates to tax. And what you do will be different based on those two different spheres within that public practitioner yes. space. And I mean, uh, one of the key things in the no clar framework, uh, to my mind, is the fact that they have put this senior member in business with the similar, uh, at a similar level to the audit engagement partner. Now, the audit engagement partner, already under Section 311 of the COPS Act, could already report breaches to ASIC anyway. But putting the CFO is a big change at a similar level because it recognizes that the CFO has the decision-making power to make changes and address matters. So that is the big change because previous auditors could anyway report and go uh, to ASIC anyway. That's a very important point I think we should note. So the key issues for disclosure, if we can jump ahead to that, uh, it relates to uh, whether there's an appropriate authority that exists depending on the factors of the particular no CLAR. For example, there may not be, it may be a breach of environmental law. 
are there particular, is there a regulator that you can report that to? In, this, in many cases, yes. But depending on what that might be, there may not be uh, the appropriate authority that you can report to. The main question you need to ask yourself is, is are you precluded by law or regulation from reporting this? And at the moment, that's key for tax. You need to ensure that where, where it's a rela in relation to tax, that there is currently laws in place that will prevent you from reporting. And so therefore your NOCLAR obligations are limited or at this point in time. We need to look at any legislative or regulatory protection for whistleblowing. And now might be a good time for us to move into the whistleblowing provisions and legislation because they do go hand in hand with, our, with the provisions in NOCLAR. So looking at the whistleblower protection legislation, it is very, very new. It isn't operative yet. It's from 1 July 2019. And it applies to corporate and financial sectors. Uh, it's not applicable at this stage to the public sector. So there's different legislation in place for those particular employees if they find an issue. It does provide protection to the informant for reporting of corruption, fraud, tax evasion, or avoidance and misconduct. And it does now apply to disclosure of tax law breaches and tax misconduct. Uh, and penalties do apply for breaches of the regimes as well. So from that date, you can disclose under the whistleblower protections and you would be considered a protected person under those whistleblower protections. That being said, you being the accountant, uh, potentially it, it wouldn't be too much of a stretch for someone to, for your client to establish whether there was any involvement from their accountant when it comes to these yeah. disclosures. So you always need to have a consideration for uh, what potential consequences might be. The definition of a whistleblower is broader um, than it has been. Uh, it includes former relationships with an entity. So you may not be involved with an entity going forward, uh, but it will include former relationships that you've had with a particular entity or person. The new terminology that is, well, it's not new terminology, but the terminology that's applicable in this regard is eligible recipient. Who are you informing to? There are particular organisations that are considered eligible recipients for information under whistleblower protection legislation, and that includes APRA, ASIC, and the ATO. So if you were to disclose to a politician or journalist, if it was in the public interest, um, that could be acceptable, but it is definitely not acceptable for any matters relating to tax. And you would only do that if it was in relation to an emergency. So say, for example, if it was a money laundering or counter-terrorism issue that you were that you became aware of, or potentially um, maybe a serious drug-related matter, then that would be the, the type of issues that you may uh, go directly to a politician or journalist about because it requires swift action and it is in the public interest. The protections that you are entitled to under whistleblower protection legislation include your right to remain anonymous. Um, and the provision of immunity, so information can't be used against you if there was a prosecution that was going to happen later. Whistleblowers may be eligible for compensation if they suffer detriment, and public companies and some proprietary companies must have whistleblower policies. There are key obligations within the code with respect to whistleblowing. Uh, and with respect to in making any type of disclosure. The prohibition on being a director, officer, including management of or including management of administration for audit clients and company secretary for an audit client. So the requirements in this regard is to consider multiple threats in total and evaluate those threats for multiple clients, referrals from one particular source. Determine if an audit or assurance client is a public interest entity uh, and then provide guidance on entities who will generally be considered PIEs in Australia. It's really important to note that private health insurance are now regulated by APRA, so they are now considered an example of a PIE. That probably wraps us up for NOCLA for now. If you have any specific questions in relation to NOCLA or whistleblowing, 
please feel free to contact us and we can, we can help you with those particular issues. We just wanted to quickly touch on before we finish up, what is on the agenda? What are the future projects for both IESPA and the APSB? So on the agenda for the, I, for the IESPA at the moment is uh, role and mindset expectations of professional accountants. So before, prior, that's been a bit of a change in terminology there. It was being referred to as professional scepticism. But professional scepticism, for, for those of you who are auditors, is a particular term that is really related to audit engagements. So from the conclusions of the round tables that were held in Paris and Tokyo, and Melbourne and Washington, uh, it was overwhelming that professional scepticism should be a term that is reserved solely for auditors. So we're now looking at the terminology role and mindset. What is the expected role and mindset of a professional accountant? That is a more longer term project. It is something that the ISPA are regularly debating, but it isn't, there aren't going to be any uh, changes in the foreseeable in the short term foreseeable future. Non-assurance services are a different matter. We have gotten changes to non-assurance services which have become operative already, but we are, it looks like the ISPA are going to make further changes to non-assurance services which look at specific types of engagements and whether they are allowed or not allowed or based on um, different types of, of, of issues such as fees or, or other types of um, intricacies with respect to each engagement. The ED with respect to non-assurance services is expected in the second half of this year, so we will have more information from the ISPA at that time. There's also a project at the moment in relation to fees, and this is with respect to audit fees and how audit fees impacts on uh, actual and perceived independence, and also in terms of the impact it has on audit quality. I'm actually on this task force for the fees working group, uh, and it, the ED for this particular project is due out in September. Uh, and it will look at uh, ratios, for example, of what's considered um, appropriate with respect to fees uh, the fees that are being charged, so on and so forth, and what, what percentage of fees uh, would create an independence issue in respect to your total fees for your entire client base. So we do have some significant work coming out of IESPA in, at the second half of the year in the non-assurance services and fees area. Technology is in respect to how we move the code into uh, the next uh, century. Uh, or the next decade uh, with respect to navigating and uh, making it more usability, improving the usability. So that's all about an e-code project that's currently happening, uh, which is very exciting and it's all about um, ensuring that the code is easily accessible, easily navigatable, and it is some, it, it becomes a tool that members go to more regularly. At the moment, we have an ED out on the alignment of part 4B with uh, ISA 3000, and that's really based on terminology. There was some issues with, of terminology between um, the audit standard and the code, and that's just bringing that into alignment. So there's nothing too, um, too exciting there. Now, in terms of the APSB future yeah. projects, so I mean I'll briefly say that there has been like there all of our other standards because the code has changed, all of our other standards needs to be updated. So we'll progress really release those. Uh, we have already done one batch, and we are hoping to get everything done for a start date of first January 2020, which is the same as the code. And then also there's uh, we are working currently on the insolvency standard and. Um, this is a revision of an existing standard. Uh, we have added a lot of uh, guidance material. There's a new uh, appendix on independence and what are uh, uh, proper professional fees and expenses. Um, so these, in the, from a substantive sense, I don't think it's a big change to the standard but more useful material and also reflecting some recent legal cases. So I'll hand over to Michelle uh, if there are questions that we need to answer. I know we've addressed the, the couple of questions which we've addressed in the chat box. So that's all very good. Thank you very both.
very much for your time today. Thank you all for attending. I'm sorry we've gone just a couple of minutes over. You will get a copy of this recording from Kahoot. They will send that out to you direct. And we will put a copy of this on CPA Australia's YouTube channel as well. So thank everybody for attending and I'll hand back to Linda to officially close the session. Excellent, thank you very much Michelle and a special thanks to Chana and Joe as well for a fantastic webinar. Finally, thank you very much to everyone for your participation as well as for your attendance today. That does formally conclude today's webinar. To exit, just click on that cross on the top right of your screen, letting you know upon exiting you'll be automatically redirected to a feedback form. Now the feedback form itself only takes about 30 seconds to complete, however it's really, really beneficial for CPA Australia as well as our panel, so please leave us your thoughts. Now just finally, just having a look at the chat box, there's a lot of thank yous there to uh, Joe and Chana there, so thank you very, very much for your presentation today. Um, I'll just pop on the music as you all exit. I hope everyone enjoys their day and hope to see you in another CPA Australia live webinar. Thanks everyone.